so good morning to all of you and uh, I thank God for the blessing to be with you and to be able to share our faith and uh, I'm so grateful to Father Francis for the Mass and the great reflections of the Mass and the gift of the Eucharist and also to Mariette for letting us um, enjoy the space of this hotel that has been so dedicated for so many years to the Lord and it's an amazing gift to have a person that in the midst of this type of world brings God and uh, shines God in the midst of these uh, uh, rushes of the world. Um, I'm going to share with you a reflection on sin and I'm going to ask uh, the Holy Spirit to guide us with His words. And I read to you from Colossians 3, from verse 18 on. Rules for Christian households. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Slaves, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, work heartily, as serving the Lord and not men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. The word of the Lord. So we all know what sin is, but not all of us know the transcendence of sin. And that's why uh, sometimes we don't have the pain of sin. Because when we don't know uh, how deep sin is and the transcendence of sin and uh, how far it goes into the next life, uh, then we don't worry about sinning. And this is common. It's common because when Jesus instituted the sacrament of confession, um, then as you enter your religion, and most of us just inherit it, we just receive it, and uh, we don't pay much attention to the value of it. We are just Catholics, we are born Catholics, most of us, and uh, so you don't understand the spirit of the religion, what, what, contain, what it contains, and one of the most important parts of the religion is the knowledge of sin. Because sin determines who you are in relationship with your lower nature, the flesh and God. And your relationship between your dealings with this material world and the dealings with the spirit, with God. And it is not easy to understand that sin is the devil. Sin is a spirit of evil. That's what sin is. And uh, when we don't have a conscience about that, and then the sacrament of confession is, is a sacrament that appeases our mind and our conscience. It gives us peace. And that's what it is. You go to confession and you feel at peace with God and self. And this is what it does. Um, but you don't understand that sin diminishes you as a person, diminishes you in the spiritual realm, and places you in an extremely dangerous spot in your journey. Because it takes lots of work in order to go back to the state you belong before you sin. See, we lose territory, spiritual territory every time we sin. 
We are in a journey towards home, towards the house of the Father. And every day is a battle, and a spiritual battle for our soul, a battle between good and evil. And those involve numbers, the economy of our soul. Our soul's economy is so incredibly perfect because God is a God of order and is a God of numbers. You know, when you read the Old Testament, you see passages where God is giving instructions to the prophet to build the temple or to do whatever task he commends to the prophet. And you notice that he's giving instructions by perfect measurements and exact doses of this. And he is a God of numbers. And everything with him is meticulous, is, is really perfect in his order. So our life is all part of an account. We are before God, we are traveling inside Him, and there are many areas of our life that are scattered because of the lack of order, the lack of conscience in everything we do. So that's why we speak a lot about the conversion of the heart, because you can convert as far as your religion. There are people that are falling away Catholics. And all of a sudden they enter into a conversion, so to say, and come back to church. So their coming back to church is their coming back to the sacraments, to a prayerful life. But it's not the coming back into the conversion of the heart, which is another conversion. Because you go back to the church, yes. And you practice your faith again. Yes, very good. But this is only the foundation. You have to build on that foundation. And what you build on that foundation is a spirituality which is growing in God. Rising yourself from the foundation into the realm of goodness of God. And that will change your life. <clears throat> it will make you good. It will make you a good person. It will make you a person of God. But for that, you need the change of heart. And the first thing you have to know in order to grow spiritually is that you have to truly confront yourself face to face with sin, the reality of sin. If you don't confront yourself with sin face to face, sin will always be your shadow and you will have an affection for sin. And there, are, there will be many sins that you have as a secret lover. Because, you know, sin is a bad lover. You know, when a woman has a bad lover, and everybody's telling her, get away from that man. That man is not good. And then she stays there. And then one day, she, the God punches her, and she shows up with a black eye. And everybody, I told you, that guy is not good. And then, as soon as she's healed, back to the bad guy to get more punches, right? And this is like a bad love, a bad lover. And this is exactly what sin is. Sin is a bad lover that gives us a black eye left and right. And we keep on coming back for more punches, right? And this is a self-destructive nature that we have. And it's part of original sin. Because we are inhabiting a mortal body, then mortality leads us very easily into a self-destructive spirit and nature. That's what sin is about. Sin is a self-destructive spirit. And then it's natural in us because since we are decaying, we are dying every day, we are less of this biolo biological self every day, we can see it go down, decaying. So that alone, even though you're not totally conscious of that, but you know things are just dying, then sin becomes a companion of that decaying, because sin is exactly that, death. So, you notice how people get addicted 
to drugs, to alcohol, to cigarettes, to impure sexuality, to gluttony, to so many things that are destructive. And, and you see how hard it is for people to get away from that. Uh, modern psychology and modern science, health sciences, they have the biggest industry ever with therapies yeah, and treatments for addictions. And it's a big industry. And uh, we know that the biggest healer of addictions, and we have seen that with the great work of Sister Alvira that just passed away with the Chenaculo. I'm sure most of you know about that. That is a healing with God. No medications, no treatments or therapies like they do scientifically. I don't say it's wrong to be treated uh, by science, but I say for us Christians, we have a much better medicine. And that medicine is conversion of the heart, and it's Jesus. Because every addiction, uh, with the exception of some addictions that create a chemical factors and replace chemical factors in your digestion system like heroin and all opioids derivatives. Uh, you need a, a chemical treatment, right, to replace those bad uh, chemicals that you get from certain drugs. But in general, Jesus is the healer, but you have to confront yourself with sin. You have the drug addict the, whatever vice it is that is keeping you in chains, you have to confront it and renounce to it and let it go. And like St. John the Baptist says, the axe is on the root. You should chop it. You know, it's like people ask me, when I was in the world, before I came back into the church, and I had many vices, and I was a worldly person. And vices for me was culture, was something we all did. We were using drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and promiscuity was part of our food, so to say. And most everybody that I grew up with in California, we were like that. So when I came back and came back into the church, like I said in the beginning, I came back into the religion, right? To go back to Mass, go back to the sacrament, go back to a life in the church. But I noticed more and more that I was not progressing because I was just being in the religion. And I knew something was missing because my heart was in changing. I didn't have the strength to let go of so many things that enslaved me, that I was in chains to. The alcohol, the drugs, the women, and I'm saying women, but in the sense of promiscuity. And uh, all of this. So little by little, I began to enter into the reality of truly letting go. Truly putting the axe on the root and chopping it and, and letting go. But one day I needed to let go of cigarettes. And I was not a daily smoker, but I smoke when I drink, and I was drinking every day. So <laughs> <laughs> I remember when sometimes they, they interview you for whatever, you know, and they say, do you smoke? You say, only social drinker. I drink. I smoke when I drink. Say, How often do you drink? Then silence. Say, Every day. <laughs> So then I decided to let go of cigarettes. And I was living in Beverly Hills, California, in, in Los Angeles. And there was a church I knew, downtown Los Angeles, which was a very long distance by foot. And I said, I'm going to go walking to that church. Um, and when I get to the church, that's going to be the end of cigarette smoking. And so I, I thought about that about three days. Every day I tried to go, I couldn't, you know, it was too much. But one day I went. Very rarely rains in California, especially in, in, in Los Angeles. It's famous for the lack of rain. And this day, three blocks later from my house, a torrential rain, right? 
And I said, I can't go back. I have to go. So I went. That church is surrounded by homeless to the point where the church is all locked and only has one door with a, with a security guard to let people in because it's filled with uh, homeless. So I made it there and obviously I was all drenched for, by the rain. You know, I looked like a homeless. So when I got, when I got to the door, they wouldn't let me in, right? The guy, the guy said, you can't come in. I say, I'm not a homeless. Yeah, that's what everybody says. <laughs> And I said, I swear I'm not a homeless. Yeah, keep the stories for yourself. <laughs> Go tell that to your mother, something like that. <laughs> and uh, so I finally made it in, and that was the end of my, my smoking. But then I had other vices, obviously, and I, I was thinking now, how can I let go of the others? I'm going to have to do some kind of sacrifices. But I realized that one day I went to visit a friend of mine, and he was really uh, bad, you know, really bad, a famous singer. And he um, put out the, his cocaine and the, the wine and everything. And it was normal to do that in a visit. We visit, and all of that was laid on the table, right? And I look at all of that, and all these people that knew me, and uh, I said to myself, uh, I think this is not what I want to do. But let's see what happens. So I, I was freely hanging out there, and we were working because we were working on a project. That's all. I'm there. I knew I was going to be there for at least 10 hours, at least, working. And this was all laying out on the table. So all those guys were doing their routine work and, and uh, using the drugs and the alcohol and working and talking and moving all day around the house. And every, but my, my focusing was on that table all the time because I wasn't using anything, but I wanted to use everything. And this was a big battle. But then I stopped for a second and saved a prayer by the pool. And I said, this is it. If I want to really do this, I have to confront it face to face and let it go. So I went to that table and I look at the cocaine and the wine and all of that. I looked at it, and it became my sin. It truly became, because it, had, it wasn't a sin before. It was just pleasure, and it was something that I enjoyed. But this time, when I confronted it, I looked at it, and it was sin. It became sin. And I knew it was destructive, and I knew it was a poison, and I knew it was wrong, and all of that. And... Uh, I got the strength little by little, and then I said, I, I renounced to it, totally renounced to it. And it was painful. It was like so difficult. It was like, a, it's like dying, like dying. But I did. And after that day, I never touched it. It was gone. And the, nobody even noticed. The good thing about that is that the way I did it, none of my colleagues that I hang out with all the time, notice that I didn't smoke, that I didn't use cocaine or alcohol, they didn't even know. And I was with them, they didn't see it, they didn't notice it. Because I was attentive, I said, oh, they're gonna start picking on me. Uh, no, but they didn't, nobody noticed. It was very strange how that happened. But then I learned that sin and and, and don't take me wrong, I'm still working in a lot of stuff. You know, this is a long journey. It's until we die. Until we die. But little by little, I began to let go of the big sins that were killing me. Totally killing me. And, uh, but I learned that we have to confront sin face to face. We have to go in the face of sin and tell it, you are evil, you are destructive, you're not good in my life, I cannot accept it in my life, you are gone from my life, you are gone. And we have to do that. We have to really do that. It's the only way we can do away with sin. And it's the only way you can truly enter into a conversion of the heart. You know, it's like for some of you that have experienced Medjugorje, we all know that Medjugorje has 
provided for the church amazing gifts and uh, gifts of conversion. And many, many of them are conversions of people that return to the church. And not all of them experience the conversion of the heart. So that returning to the church is just the, the beginning. If they have the blessing of having a community or a follow-up by a priest or someone that loves them that is already on the other side of the shore, will help them to overcome their religion and rise into the spirit and really convert the heart. And this is a triumph of the church because when we make it to convert the heart, we become an amazing instrument of God, especially when you know sin, when you know the darkness. You know that. It's like one time I uh, met in New York in a retreat I was given in, Br in Brooklyn, uh, a young girl, probably 20 years old, and she was counseling a group of girls that were pretty, pretty wild looking, you know, uh, about three or four girls, and then she called me and said, come, uh, give them a blessing, pray for them. So I pray for them, and then they left, and he told me they are prostitutes from down the street, and, and I said, oh, okay. He said, I am just talking to them every time I come because I was one of them, right? See, I was, I, actually, she was actually running the block. She was the chief of the block, right? And these girls were uh, looking after her, but they, they were not doing it. They were not entering into a change. But then she told me, uh, many times I went back and went from the church down the street to continue my life in the street with all these soldiers that I had. Four times she fell back. And then she said, one day I came back after having a horrible week and uh, walked up the stairs to the church. And when I reached the last step, I look in and I saw this crucified Jesus there at the entrance. And I realized I had never really converted my heart. I only had come back into the religion. So every time I came back to the church, I came back to my religion. I came back to the church to confess, to pray, to, but just to that. I didn't come back to the heart, to change the heart. And that's why since my heart was broken, wounded, perverted, corrupted, then that heart was no good. So. All I needed was a small wind to push me back to the street. So that day, when she walked in and found that out, then Jesus picked her up and really, really let her change the heart. And ever since then, she never went back. And she was an amazing apostle. She died very young because she lived a very abusive life uh, with uh, excesses of alcohol, drugs, and the nightlife and all of that. So she contracted a serial disease, hepatitis, something, and then she died. And I, by really by chance, I, I went back to New York like three years later, and I was in a church in Manhattan, like uh, in center Manhattan. And, and uh, there was a funeral like across, you know, in another church. And uh, this lady that was like... Uh, like a lady that sells things in the street, you know, an Italian old lady. She told me, there is a saint being buried there. I know that saint. She is a saint. I have a, I have a relic of her, a piece of her hair. And I said, who's that? I didn't remember the name of that woman. And she said, she was a prostitute, but she converted. Then I said, ah, it must be the girl. But she was so young, I didn't think she would have been dead. So I crossed the street and went there, and sure enough, all the prostitutes, prostitutes were there. You know, like so many young girls that were still prostitutes were, were in the funeral, right? So I knew it was her. So it was incredible the feeling I had, because I had the chance to open the casket and look at her. And she had such a such an amazing face, such an incredible face. So I knew she made it, you know, 
we don't know how high up she made it, but she made it. And, and that was the triumph. But she was the one that I could relate to when we speak about confronting sin, <coughs> going face to face with sin and saying no, and understanding that it is the heart that has to change, the heart, not our habits, because we can change habits. Like you can change the habit of not going to church and then change it for going to church. It's just a habit. It's just, a, it's just something you do. But changing the heart is not a habit. See? Changing the heart is bringing truly God into your heart, into your life, which is, I truly love you, Lord. Truly love you, Lord. Because I'm going to obey to you everything. I'm going to convert. And this is so important. You know, it's like the answer to holiness is goodness. We, I always speak about this because people become very sophisticated about religion. You know, today you see so many people <laughs> studying the divine will. And that's good. Okay, that's fine. If you want to read 20 mystical books about divine will to find out what is the will of God, fine. No problem. But there is something very important about the conversion of the heart. And it is God's will is only one. Our sanctification. You don't have to read 20 mystical books about the divine will to know what God wants from you. The only thing wants, God wants from you is your true conversion of the heart. To let go of sin, that's what God wants. The only thing that he wants. doesn't want anything else. You can get very sophisticated about divine will. Oh, yes, I know. But that could be a distraction because you can get so complicated that you get confused at the end. And you don't even know what divine will is about. But St. Paul says, the will of God is... Our sanctification. And Jesus said, they told him, your mother and your brothers are looking for you. And he used that opportunity to tell everyone, my mother and my brothers are those who do the will of my father. See, he said. So the will of the father was bigger and higher than our relationships. It was bigger than blood, you know, than blood relations. It was bigger than anything, the will of God. So what is the will of God? Our sanctification. How do you become a saint? You don't have to get too sophisticated in studying to be a saint. No, because then you will never make it. You will be too intelligent to be a saint. So <laughs> too educated to be a saint. You just have to become good. That's what you have to do. <coughs> become good. See, every time I'm checking myself all the time. And I can be really bad. You know, I can wake up and be a disaster. And I go like, what have I done? I look back five hours already of the day and I already blew it. And I was bad for five hours. And then I say, when am I going to change? But still you keep on going. But the fight is, you have to become good. And then everything you do, you have to turn, you turn it into goodness. Everything, because we have the sap of good and evil in us. It flows through us. Like St. Paul tells us, there is a stain in us that leads us to sin. It's not us, but it is in us. That's why the wrong I don't want to do is the wrong I end up doing. But knowing that it is not us, it helps us to go on top of that and put the rims on it and face it, face to face, and go, no. It's like how many times you are in a conversation with somebody, and you know that if you get into an argument with that person about that particular topic, you're going to end up in a real <coughs> difficult situation. And it's totally unnecessary. It's like you kill love. And, you, and it's unnecessary to win an argument. What for? 
but it's good to keep the love and to keep the friendship. And I don't mean that we have to please people because that is another defect, human respect on top of fear of God. That is a big danger, right? A lot of people do that, especially in this world we live today. People are more into human respect than fear of God. But I'm talking about a plain, regular conversation with friends and people you know, and then an argument springs up about whatever. And sometimes if you keep your cool and you stay center, you don't enter into the argument. You see, you flow with it, with love, and you keep the moment and you keep the friendship and you keep the love. And this is a, a science, an art. It's the art of goodness. It's making the moment good. And so it is with every sin. You see, the way you treat your food, some people live to eat, and some others eat for, to live, right? And this is something we have to learn, how to deal with everything in our lives and turn it into good. And this is how we walk in a path of holiness, by being good. There's no, no more sophisticated teaching about goodness or about holiness. You just have to become good. You know, one time I met a very humble and a priest in a little town in South America in a mission I had with very, very poor people. And uh, this priest told me, Okay, we are going to this town up there. And he showed me the town way up on a mountain. He said, we have to go walking. It's going to be very difficult because it's treacherous. So I said, no problem. I came here for that. So we went. It was three times worse than he told me, right? Horrible. We made it there with mud up to my almost my waist. See, sometimes they had to pull me out of the mud because I was, I was there drowned in the mud. It was very bad. So we got there and then we went into this little hut, hut of an old lady, right? And, and he told me, this is the holy woman of town. And it wasn't a town. It was like a village on top of a mountain, maybe 10 houses. And so we, we sat there. Uh, and the lady looked at me and said, oh, how horrible it is to see people that come from the cities, from the big cities. He said, you have so much traffic in your face that it hurts me. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> see, the one that felt so holy, and I'm there sitting like a piece of trash, really, because the woman was looking at me like, you have so much traffic in your face, it hurts me. And she was looking to the other side. And the priest grabbed her and said, please don't do that. No, just calm down. This is my friend. He came here to preach to us and teach us. Teach us? We are going to teach him. He has nothing to teach us. Look at his face. And it was very difficult, you know, the moment with her. And, and it lasted for a long time because she didn't change. She gave us coffee, and we went to a little place where they had the people gathering for me to speak. And then she came walking like this and sat in the front looking at me. And then, you know, my speech was cut in half, I guess, because I was looking at her. I didn't know, <laughs> didn't know what to do. And all these farmers were, like, suspicious, you know? Because they knew she wasn't happy about me, so none of them would trust me, right? She was the mother of the village. So I was in a lot of trouble there. So then I began talking, and I said to them, well, here is a guy that has a lot of traffic in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and I used everything she said. And when I finished saying what I said, she cracked up and laughed so loud. <laughs> and then she said, after all, you're not that bad, right? <laughs> and I began to feel a little better, and they accepted me. But that was the, a humbling experience, you know, because she taught me a lot with that, a lot. It's like, and I knew it was the Holy Spirit teaching me. It was God that took me there 
And it was such a treacherous walk and all of that to get to a person that humiliated me for a long time, you know. And, uh, but there, it, there was prepared a gift from God because he humbled me in a big way. Like telling me, don't make any, don't have any ideas of yourself. I say, don't do that. See, everything that is taking place through you is because of the Holy Spirit, it's not you. You have a long way to go. You have a long way to go, and you haven't even done the minimum yet. Yeah? Work hard and harder. And this was the message, was very clear. And then I continue on working hard in this face-to-face -face with sin. Many times people come to me and ask me, how can I stop lying, or how can I stop stealing, or stop this, whatever sins? And I said, you know how you stop lying? Say, you stop lying. <laughs> there, there is, it's like, how can I stop fornicating? Don't fornicate. <laughs> it's, it sounds so simple, but it is the truth. You know, it's like if, you, if you don't do it, you just don't do it, and you will never do it, right? It's like... A, you know how modern psychology is always putting people in a process, right? So you're going to stop smoking and say, we're going to start. Step one. And they, have, <laughs> and they keep you through steps. And a year later, you fall back, right? Then you have to start again. And this is the greatest industry, right? Steps. There's no such a thing, you know? If you want to change, you have to change. And you have to go straight, face to face with sin and vice, you know, and go and say, hey, who are you? What are we going to do? I think this game is over. I'm going to face you. And I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to finish with you. And we can do it. I have done it. I still have a way to go, but I have done it. I testified to that with my life. And I said, it is possible. If a sinner like me, can do what I have done, anybody can do it. I was just telling Mariette before I, I began talking that an old lady in Colombia was always asking me to go to her prayer group. And I go through Colombia for short periods and never had time to go to her prayer group. And one day, after many years, I ended up in her group. And they were all ladies of between 70 and 90, right? very prayerful, and I knew them all. So I got there, and she went to introduce me, right? And she went and said, Marino has been really bad. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> bad. Really bad. And all, all the other ladies were going, stop it, like that. And I'm standing beside her in the introduction. <laughs> And they are looking at me like, like that. And she continued on. Bad, really bad, terrible, bad. <laughs> she was like, she was stuck in there, right, with that. She didn't know what else to say. Yeah. So one of the women interrupted her and said, but not only bad, he's also good. And all of that, try, trying to make it up. And I said, don't worry about it. You see, I know how bad I am, how bad I have been, and I'm working on it. Just have patience. Have patience with me. And that's, that's the way we deal with it. But it's just like so amazing how the Spirit humbles you. All these years, all these years for her waiting for me to go there. And this is what happens in the introduction, right? <laughs> and, and, but I know it's always the Spirit talking to you. Always the Holy Spirit. I, I always say, I wonder what the Spirit wanted to tell me. Well, it's very clear. It's like, <laughs> humble yourself. <laughs> Don't forget who you are. Don't forget where you come from. <laughs> it's so important to remember where we come from. That doesn't mean we have to dwell in our past and be, feel guilty about our past. No, because God makes us new, and it's a promise of Jesus. But we still have to remember where we come from as far as what God has done in our lives. 
the graces of God. If it wouldn't be because of God, I wouldn't be here. You know, it's just a miracle. I am here. So the Lord is always leading us. But I realize that the key, the key for our sanctification, our purification, our amendment and reparation of all the sins we have confessed, the change of our life is to really, truly convert the heart. Make sure we are working on becoming a better person every day. I tell people, look back one year and be sincere. Could you tell that you are a better person today than you were a year ago? Are you able to say that? Because if you're not able to say that, I can only tell you one thing. You're stuck. You're not moving. <laughs> you're not moving. You are not growing. And you're wasting your life. Because we have to use every moment we have. We have to use every minute God gives us. But we have to use it to grow, to sanctify ourselves, to, to rise above all this lower, muddy self and get into being better, a better human being. That's what we need. We need to do it all the time. So it's very good to double check yourself and look back only to make sure you are growing, only to make sure you're changing. That's what you do. You, you, you are sincere about that. A reflection about your true self. Because we are by nature very mysterious, very astute. And, and we don't want to change. Our lower nature is so horrible. You know, you notice that when you tell your flesh to fast, like we were talking yesterday. We are fasting today. And you hear the screaming from the stomach. No! <laughs> We ain't fasting. <laughs> I am sick. I cannot fast. I will die. Right? It's like, and this is what we know about self. It's very mysterious. So we need to really become strong to do what we have to do in order to grow into goodness, to become better, and to dare to let go of sin and to face it, to face it really. And it's so important to do that because there is no changing of your heart if you don't dare to confront sin, to confront it. It's like when I had my first ecstasy with Jesus in the jungles in Colombia, the Lord showed me three capital sins that were prominent in my life and for a long time. And one of them was pride. See, in my family was common, especially on my mother's side was common to feel better than others. They, they will speak like that freely. Oh, and they look down at people, you know, like... And uh, I grew up like that. And I didn't even notice that I was like that. But I had this, like, almost second skin selection of people and things like that. And when I came back into the church after my experience with Jesus, and he showed me one of my capital sins that was horrible in my life was pride. So I began detecting it, and it was everywhere. Everywhere in my life was pride. Everywhere. And it was incredible. It was like taking a terrifying infestation out of my life, you know? And still, I find areas of my life where pride is still there, and I'm just pushing it away pushing it away. And it's so incredible. I, one time I was preaching in, um, in Africa, in Uganda, in, uh, outside of Kampala, and uh, I was in this orphanage. And the guy that runs the orphanage told me, uh, don't, don't take it personal, but when people see a white person here, somebody that is not black, right, uh, they have already an attitude, and it's natural in people. It's not like they want to be like that. It's just like, it's the race. The race that goes and is impacted by the other race, right? But it has nothing to do with racism. It's just natural. So that made me think a lot. I said, natural 
I said, I don't know how natural that is really, you know, it's probably cultural. It's some, somebody told them that it has to be learned by somebody. And so then in that trip, I understood that I had to work that out too. Which I thought I was free from racism of, of the, to differentiate people by races. But there in that orphanage, after this man spoke, and told me that about them, I told him, don't worry, I have the same. You see, I'm impacted by black, but not because I want to be impacted by that, but I am impacted by that. But I realized I was impacted for the wrong reasons, not like them. My impacting was why I inherited from my family, right? So I had to clean it up. And that was a great gift of God he gave me. Then... In the airplane on the way back to London, after I left Kampala, this lady was sitting beside me. It was a missionary, a Protestant missionary from New York, and we were talking. And I told her about races and all of that. And uh, then when we were talking, she said, but we have to understand that we are all different. See, I'm not equal to a black, I'm white, and all of this. So I told her, I'm going to say only one thing to you. See, if you die, and you go before the tribunal of Jesus, and you felt different than anybody in this world, you're not going to enter the sanctuary of God until you get it straight. See, and Protestants don't believe in purgatory. So that must have been really difficult for her, right? Because she didn't know how to do it then. So I said, you're not going to enter the sanctuary. Because when we die and we are before Jesus, in order to enter, you have to be clean. You have to be one with every one. Oneness. Oneness. Otherwise, how can you enter the sanctuary of oneness if you are not one with everyone? See, this is the secret, and a lot of people don't understand that. That's why it is difficult. You see, go in the streets and go in populated places, train stations, airports, all races there, flowing, all races flowing. Especially, you have opportunities in big cities here to find all these races mixed. And, and that is a great opportunity to work on yourself and say, do I feel... Like I can accept all these people and walk like one with them? Or do I still have problems feeling different than them? Because that is a great defect, you know. It's something that is going to work against you when you die. And it's purgatory. And it's not good to have it. So it's not easy to do. But it's something we have to do. Because if we don't do it, we are in trouble. And it's not a sin. But it's a terrible imperfection. So, and it can turn into a sin if it turns into hatred or discrimination. But if it is just the way you feel about it, it's not a sin, but it keeps you from holiness. It keeps you from growing spiritually. It keeps you from making your heart good, which is really bad if something keeps you from that. So I'm going to end with a reading from the second letter of St. John, it's only one chapter, from verse 4 on, on, Truth and Love. I rejoice greatly to find some of you children following the truth, just as we have been commanded by the Father. And now I beg you, lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we follow his commandments. This is the commandment, as you have heard from the beginning, that you follow love. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Look to yourselves, that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. Anyone who goes ahead and does not abide 
in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into the house or give him any greeting. For he who greets him shares his wicked work. The word of the Lord. So we praise God and we thank him for everything he gives us. And especially I ask God to bless you and to give you the discernment of sin so that you can really confront it face to face and have the courage to let it go. Amen. Amen.